Well, good morning, everyone. Great to be here to worship the Lord. The, I was up early, early this morning, and there was a nice warm wind. And at around 8 or 9, it shifted to something a little more cooler, and, uh, which I enjoy personally. I know. Amen to that. Uh, great to have the worship team here again this morning. And we've got uh, uh, Peggy with us. And uh, yes, I know, uh, Jer Jerry's wife. And, and uh, Derek and Marsha are back. So great to have you back, folks. <laughs> I... Uh, not a whole lot to say to open off, except I wanted to start off with these words from Jesus. I don't know how you're feeling this morning. I went to this passage this morning. It says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So life has a way of really bringing you down and making things feel heavy and, and you feel anxious. Be reminded that when you come to Christ, it's all about rest and, and, uh, and an easy uh, pressure on your life that eases off. And so uh, if you're not feeling that, that's why we come and worship, why we come to be here together as a family of faith to just enter into the rest that Jesus offers us. So let's do that as we open off in prayer here and worship. Lord, as we come today... I pray that any, any anxiety, any burdens that would be on our hearts that wouldn't be from you, that you would lift those things away. Uh, Lord, the things that trouble us, uh, perhaps we've lost a loved one, perhaps we're concerned about the future, perhaps we have health issues, Lord, perhaps we don't know how we're going to pay the bills. I pray that as we worship you this morning, that we would find rest for our souls, knowing that the creator of the universe is in this room. And in your hands, we are okay. In Jesus' name we come, amen. amen. Let's stand together and sing, shall we? song 
song of praise, hallelujah. It's a song of praise, hallelujah.
You can turn to John 6. If you don't, it's on the screen there for you. Jesus feeds the 5,000 is what we're going to get into this morning. At least 5,000. Uh, sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. I'd probably follow him around too, wouldn't you? <laughs> uh, then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Now he asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Probably not very far. But with Jesus, uh, anything is possible. So verse 10, Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by Himself, Of course, he was going to become king through the cross and resurrection, so it wasn't the hour yet. Let's take a few moments now and pray, shall we? Lord, coming out of that passage of Scripture, I guess the first thing I would pray is that if anybody needs things multiplied in their lives, I pray that they would look to you. Lord, if we need more resources more funds, perhaps things are tight. Maybe we need more grace and mercy. Maybe we're having a hard time. Out of you flows life. And so we come to you today, Lord, uh, seeking that life, asking that you would take the little bit that we have and multiply it. I know for myself and really any of us here, Lord, each day we get up and we face the day with five small loaves of bread and two fish, and you use what we have. You use who we are. You take us where we're at, and you 
somehow use us to help other people. And so, Lord, we do want to offer ourselves to you. I don't know who this little boy was or how we got caught up uh, in the event, but thank you for using little children to perform this miracle. A kid's lunch to feed thousands of people. Lord, I pray that if anyone in here feels inadequate, less than, maybe we feel too old and we just feel like we're a burden to other people, Lord, I pray that those thoughts would be far removed from our minds. Lord, you love to use the young, you love to use the old, and you love to use everyone in between. It's not how much we have, it's our willingness to do it. Lord, the last song that we sung about the Holy Ghost, your Holy Spirit, your presence. Lord, you are in our midst, and I pray that we wouldn't be scared of the Holy Spirit. Spirit, we do pray that you would have your way with us. You are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God, and we worship you. And, and Jesus, when you ascended, you did pour out your Spirit on all flesh. And with faith in Jesus, we know that we've been baptized, we've been filled with your Spirit. And Lord, we at times hide from you, though, and so I pray that any fear we might have of you, that maybe there's some sin or some shame there, and we think, I don't know. I don't know if God loves me. I'd, I don't know if God's, like, where is God right now in my life? Lord, I pray that you would Remind us today in our worship that you are always there. Your love is ever present. You are with us as we worship you today. You're the reason why we're here. Lord, I pray that any hearts of stone in this room would melt. Any minds that are fighting or in anger would, would be stilled. That we would see you. And I, I hear that question you asked Philip when you said, you know, where shall we get money to buy enough bread for these people? Help us not to look around at what's around us, but to look up at who's there and to know that with you anything is possible. Lord, I pray that if anyone's got a situation in their life today that seems impossible, that they would just lean on you, the God of the impossible who can create things from nothing. Lord, refresh our faith today. Give us uh, strength to keep going as we continue to worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as we continue to sing along, we do have a children's program prepared, but I don't see a whole lot of kids unless, uh, unless Joan, you want to go along with them, but that's all right. Maybe there's some in the overflow. I don't, need, don't know Christina, but let's, we'll continue to sing along and worship nonetheless. Here we go. Faithful one, so unchanging
I call out to you again and again. Lord, I call out to you again and again. You are my song that, that he would come and live in us and that's what he tells us he does is we put our faith in him and so you know, we can make it through anything Jesus said these words he said I'm the bread of life I'm the bread of life a profound claim that no one can make nor ever will yeah that's what he said he was he said I'm the bread of life we've all got bread in our homes or at least have eaten bread for most of our lives, unless you're on a keto diet. <laughs> some people talk about it, but I don't know if people actually do it, but I think some do it for a certain period of time. 
What Jesus is saying, because since bread is a staple food back then, and you could easily say uh, he could have said rice if he was in a different culture as well, but you need him like you need bread to make it through the next day. He's the only one who will sustain your life. The only one who will satisfy your soul, the only one who can give you what you really need, salvation, real life, and life eternal. He's the source of life. If you're interested, I started a new Bible study this fall going through the I Am Statements of Jesus. You can get online, and this past week I talked a bit about him saying, I am the bread of life. But this morning, with that in mind, I, I want to spend some time on, this, uh, on a third sign in the book of John, the feeding of the 5,000. And it comes just before Jesus says he's the bread of life as he feeds a multitude of people. And by the way, uh, when you think of that number, that's the equivalent population of the town of Windsor and some of its surrounding areas, all from five loaves of bread and two small fish from a kid's lunch. It's, it's, it's incredible to think about. I don't know what we would do if everybody showed up here at the church from the town and surrounding area to provide them, to provide them lunch. Um, it's incredible. It's a miracle. And so John describes it as a sign in verse 14. It signifies, it reveals the glory of God in Christ. Now what could feed thousands of people with next to nothing possibly reveal about the glory of Christ, about who this Jesus is, except that Christ is the source of life for everyone, out of which comes all we need to exist as represented in the food that they ate that day. He's the creator. He can make, he can make something from nothing. He says, let there be light, and there is light. Let there be land, and there was land, and there be vegetation, and there's vegetation. Now, because of this, he's the Messiah. They would have understood this. It reveals that he is the Messiah, the one who was appointed to come. You see, he performs the miracle when Passover is near. The Passover is when the Jews would celebrate their deliverance from slavery, when God brought them out of Egypt, and into the wilderness to worship him. And in the wilderness, God provided manna from heaven for them to eat, to sustain them. And this is what God does here. These people are following him around, thousands of people following him around. They're hungry, and so he gives them food to eat. It reveals that the God who provided for Israel in the wilderness is still active in their lives and will provide for his people as they walk through a new spiritual wilderness with Christ on their journey of faith with him until we reach our eventual promised land and glory. The same way God gave their ancestors bread from heaven, Christ gives it to them and all who would come to him. He's the Messiah who has the power to deliver, to feed, to sustain life, a source of food that nothing on earth can compare to. There was an event uh, many years earlier that pointed to this miracle, if you're interested. In 2 Kings 4, Elisha the prophet I had a man come to him with 20 barley loaves, interesting, and, the, and the, uh, the boy had five barley loaves. Elisha tells the man to feed a hundred men. <clears throat> Meanwhile, Jesus will feed thousands. Remember, it says 5,000. It doesn't include the women and children present. We know that children were present. That's why the boy had lunch. So you could easily make that number up to around 10,000 people. We don't know for sure. But in 2 Kings, the man replied to Elisha like Andrew did to Jesus and said, you know, how do we, how do we feed all these people with next to nothing? Give it to the people, said Elisha, because they will eat with some left over, and just like with Jesus, but with 12 baskets left over. Same type of miracle as Elisha way back when, but with Christ, it is much less for a whole lot more. With Elisha, it was a ratio of about 1 to 10 or less. With Jesus, it was a ratio of at least 1 to 714 based on what he had. It's just out of this world to begin with, even multiply something, get multiplied by that much with no effort on Jesus' part at all. And so behold the Messiah, the fulfillment of Deuteronomy 18, the prophet who would come into the world as they cried out in verse 14. 
the one Elijah and Elisha pointed to. And so they would have seen, you know, the kingdom of God has come in Christ the Messiah, which is why they wanted to make him king at the end of the passage by force. That gives you the big idea of the miracle. But I think we've got to appreciate a few things about God that come from the passage out of his performing the miracle that I think we can learn from reveals some things about God that I think are important for all of us to reflect on as we worship him this morning. The big I, the, one of the big things off the top is that God is compassionate. He's compassionate. So appreciate that Jesus is tired. He's been going around. He's been teaching, uh, doing ministry. That's why he's sitting down on a mountainside with his disciples. The guy's the guy's gassed. I mean, he's tired. He's been, and yet, uh, he's got thousands of people following him around. Um, worth noting, by the way, that a town or village in this time period would have been about 100 to 200 people. So if you've got anywhere from five to 10,000 people, you've got literally towns and villages of people that have just left their towns and villages and are just walking around with him. Uh, they don't have, you know, Coleman uh, camping gear, and they just don't have any food with them. I mean, how do, you, how do you transport food? They would have been hungry. He doesn't abandon them. He's tired, but he doesn't abandon them. He doesn't leave them alone. He's got compassion on them. He's, he's, bitty, he's busy, but he makes time. He's not bitty. I shouldn't say that. He's busy, uh, but he makes time. Um, he sacrifices his time to help people. This week I came across a devotion in our daily bread. Maybe some of you read it. And here's what it said. In February 2020, as the COVID-19 crisis was just beginning, a newspaper columnist's concerns struck me. Would we willingly self-isolate? She wondered. Would we change our work, our travel, and shopping habits so other people wouldn't get sick? And this isn't just a test of clinical resources like medical needs, she wrote, but our willingness to put others out, to put others out for, to put ourselves out for others. So suddenly the need for virtue was on the front page. When I read that, sorry, I botched the wording a little bit there, but the passage struck me. Are we willing to put ourselves out for others? Forget civil liberties, and, and trust me, they're important. They came at a great cost. But the whole pandemic has caused people and organizations and businesses to literally stop and say, what is best for the community? Even over and against profit. <laughs> what is best for others? How can I show compassion? I realize the complexities with this issue, and while we're facing, walking through this final stage of it, Hopefully, families are divided, certain people are feeling shamed, <laughs> millions have died. But for me, what I found in that little passage from our daily bread as I was reading about Jesus feeding people in the background was to remember to put others first and to have compassion on people. So God's compassionate. Take a big gulp because here's another one. We learn from the miracle. Uh, he will test your faith. Yeah. He will test your faith. I need to spend some time on this. So you've got a multitude of people following Jesus and his disciples around, and they're hungry. Jesus, with intention and purpose, looks at one of his disciples, Philip, and says... Where are we going to get bread for these people? I mean, if he said that to me, I don't, like, man, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's a test. It's a test. There's two responses, one from Philip and one from Andrew. Uh, I want to spend more time on Philip. Philip's response is the accountant. I'm going to call him the accountant. He says, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one here to have just one bite. Like, we don't have enough money for this. He had loaned any bread around to actually buy enough for these people. 
here's the accountant. Like, it isn't going to happen. There's not enough money. Honestly, friends, this one comes up all the time in church. Let's step out in faith. And there's always that one guy in the room that'll say, can't afford it. Right? Maybe you've said that. I've said it at times, too. And we forget that Jesus is in our midst, the bread of life. Now, you'd have to appreciate what I said last week about having a, 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 a silly faith or a fanatical faith. Trust here is based in reality and in what God is calling you to do that's consistent with his word. Good money management is found throughout scripture. We need accountants. God raises up accountants for a reason. What, what's at play here is Philip's bean counting in front of Jesus who was testing him to trust in him. Right? Jesus is the one asking him, where are we going to get enough bread? And Philip is looking around at the money that they would have to have in order to do it. You forget that God is in the room with you. God is in your house with you. God is walking with you. Two quick examples here. One of the biggest gifts for me when I went through seminary, and God has used this multiple times over since I've been in ministry, was to learn to trust in God to actually provide for it. I learned a lot of things in my books, in my classes, but I also learned a tremendous amount in God's ability to provide for me while I followed him. I think if somebody else would have footed the bill for my studies, I wouldn't have learned as much. At that time, I went to the most expensive school and city to learn in this country. Coming into it with only enough money to pay the first semester and two or three months rent. That's all I had. That's nuts. But, but I knew, we knew that God was calling us to do this thing. For the first several months, Melissa and I didn't even have a bed to sleep on. I remember that. We literally slept on a sleeping bag in our apartment that we had. And you know, I don't think of that in a bad way. Sometimes I miss that. We get too much stuff. Like, we have too much stuff. We went across the country with everything we owned in the back of a 92 Ford Tempo. That was the funnest time of my life, man. That was, it really was. We have too much stuff. Here's the test. God was calling me and us to do it, and he provided. So we went, and God provided with no student loan. Until my final year, I did take one because Chelsea was born and, and uh, um, we're trying to get through. But I'll give another example. We, you know, we, we moved here to Pisant as a church family. COVID hits us. The government starts handing out money. The question was raised internally, and appropriately so, should we take a loan as a church to help us through? Because if they're giving out, maybe that's something we should be doing. Some churches did it. I felt so strongly, uh, I was adamant that this was a test. I wasn't alone. If God provided for our move to come here, he would provide through COVID. And it would be premature to do anything without walking with God for a while. Well, it turns out that God did provide. We continue to pay the bills. The mortgage keeps dropping. We never took out a loan, and we are in good financial position. He provided with what we had. Not flush with cash, but food on the table and roof over our head. What I'm saying is that following Jesus means that you will reach points where he will test you on purpose. He will test you. He will test your family. He will test your community of faith. Trusting in God usually leads to a time where there is a crisis of faith. And he, he brings you to those points so you can't just keep saying it. He actually wants to see you live it out. And he will test you specifically in the area of provision. He loves to bend your wallet because your wallet and your heart are very closely connected. God is after greater faith. And if you're trusting in money, he has ways of, of eliminating your resources in your life so that you will trust on him more. 
I will say, though, testing isn't always in the context of you having a little and needing more. Testing actually can be in you having a lot and not giving at all. Some people are doing very well, and that can become a burden in and of itself. Wealth can choke your faith. Too much money can be a curse. It's a quote from Jim Carrey where he talked about that. We all think we want to be rich until you are, and then you realize it wasn't the answer you were looking for. Wealth can choke faith. The scriptures talk about that. So if you feel like your faith is having a hard time, are you swimming in cash? Are you hoarding too much? Give more and stretch yourself. Money is a deeply spiritual thing because it preys on your heart. It leads you, tempts you in ways, to, to be honest, it's hard to describe, but it, it's like the Lord of the Ring when they're all after this, this ring. I mean, what, was, what is this ring? My, it leads, the love of money leads to greed and vanity, pride and lust and selfishness. It can suck the spiritual oxygen out of your blood. And so when God tests you financially, God is trying to reorient your heart and mind towards him. To get you out of the gutter that you're in, the spiritual gutter. He tests Philip. He will test you. We've had it as a community of faith. And when you're going through it, you just you lean on him and trust him. And you go back to the basics. Prayer, Bible reading, worshiping with other Christians, giving. The second response here comes from Andrew, just, just quickly, but he's pretty practical. Andrew says, well, there's a boy here with uh, five loaves of bread and two fish. So, um, reminds me of my mother in a way. Don't have a lot, but we got some stuff we can throw in the pot from the fridge. <laughs> we'll see if it fills you. Unfortunately, his answer doesn't, doesn't really help because it's still not enough food for people. What do they do? Well, Jesus had a plan all along. This next point I had a hard time putting into words, but I'll try to... God multiplies through brokenness. Jesus is going to take what the boy has and multiply it. It says Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and then began to distribute the food. So here's the catch. The food starts to multiply only as it is being distributed. It doesn't sit there and multiply. When they use it for God's kingdom and it gets distributed, that's when the multiplication happens. As it is being broken for others to eat. Take a loaf, break it in half, it turns into four, and then eight, and then so on. And this is how God loves to do things. As you give, it multiplies. As you share, it multiplies. As you pour yourself out, life is given to others. But, as Jesus will teach elsewhere, if you hoard, it dies. If you, if you keep, it withers. If you hide, it fades. But give, and it increases. Invest, and it grows. Offer, and it develops. From a seed, God grows a tree. This is how the kingdom of God comes. This is how God operates this is what Jesus does here, and this is how the miracle happened. To me, it is a sign of how God functions and how we are called to as well. Jesus himself will die like a kernel of wheat to the ground and produce a, har produce a harvest uh, of millions and billions of people through one life. And even deeper than that, it... It must be broken to multiply. In Matthew's accounts, in Matthew's, Matthew's account, it says that Jesus broke the bread. Life flows out of brokenness, not togetherness. Um, if you can hear me here. When you have it all together, life can pass you by and wither. But when you are broken and call out to God, he can use you in ways you never thought possible. He can do things with you you were never open to. When you're broken, he will bring you to places you were never willing to go with him. When you are broken, God can use you to bless others. Think about it. It's the sinner 
who's saved. It's saved sinners who then share the gospel to others. It's fallen people who help the lost. It's the meek who inherit the earth. It's the weak who are strong. It's the humble who are exalted. The broken who are healed and blessed as they lean on the everlasting arms of Christ. The kingdom of God grows and multiplies through brokenness, not through having it all together. His power is manifest in our weakness. And so when the sheep scattered out of Jerusalem because of persecution, that's when the gospel went out. The power of the kingdom of God is experienced in brokenness because when we are broken, we see who we truly are and who we truly need. So brokenness is not necessarily a curse. There's tremendous blessing to be found in it. And one other thing. I, I thought this was kind of cool, but I... In this miracle, unlike the other ones we talked about, God is using people to bless other people. The lunch from the boy to feed others. Unlike the water and the wine, which was all Jesus, right? He just turned it into, into wine. The healing, which was all Jesus, although the man did come to Jesus and he prayed. We talked about that. But this miracle only happens with the participation of people. A boy, people distributing the food, people receiving it, people eating together, and there is Jesus in the midst. The bread of life will use you and me and all of us to reveal his glory. For some of you, you're going to need other people in your life to experience the miracle God wants to unleash for you. You need other people to experience the miracle that God wants to unleash in your life. When you yourself try to save others, you can't. We call it having a savior complex. You're the type of independent person who can do it all on your own. And I'm the, I'm the president of that club. You will miss out on what God has for you in Christ if you choose that path. But if you, if you receive help, if you seek guidance, if you listen to others, get connected with other Christians... For God to give you the miracle you've been asking for, you can't keep going after life alone. You will need others to experience that miracle, like here in the feeding of the 5,000. For some of you, the next stage of your life may be a loss of independence, and that may not be a bad thing. You're asking for God's help, and the way he's going to provide it is through other people. For some of us, it's hard to do that, though, isn't it? And the last thing I'll say, I love this part. That he, he blesses us beyond our need, beyond your need. He, I love how it ends. There's more left over than was needed. So here's a question. What if God wanted to bless you beyond what you could imagine? Would you have a hard time receiving it? Some of us think so little of ourselves that we, we almost think that, I don't know, God shouldn't give us anything. We don't deserve anything. What if God wanted to give you more than you actually need? And, and in Christ, his blessings are like that. I take pride in having just what I need. I like to, you know, when you cook a meal, you have just enough food and just enough on the plates and there's hardly anything left over and it's like, yeah, we just, we were, you know, real frugal with that. I like that. But what if God really did give you more than you needed? You know, a bumper crop every year. Not because you hoarded, just because he wanted to bless you. Bless us beyond our needs. God, and by the way, God seems to love to do this, to just, to just pour out abundance on people's lives. When we have a plan, there's less, but when God acts, there's always abundance. You know, not only did I finish seminary, I mean, I went on to write a thesis. Not only did God provide through COVID, but I mean, we pretty much built a whole new roof, took a steeple off, uh, and now we're planning to create a new position, 
focusing on children and youth ministry. And we're going to jump out and we're going to do it in faith. This is what God loves to do. I knew a, uh, a Christian before he got called to ministry. He wanted to go into business and he wanted to be a millionaire. Not because he was vain. He, just, he was a goal-oriented kind of industrious type of guy. He eventually decided he was to go in ministry instead, gave all that up. Uh, at present, he sits on a home that's valued around one to two million dollars. God gave it to him anyway. <laughs> God loves to do this. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. God loves to bless his people. God wants to bless you. Seeking him first is what unlocks that in your life. As people give to him, share what they have to others, God not only feeds you, but there's leftovers for the next day. To me, it's a picture of his love more than anything, which he has lavished on us in Christ. I mean, he's, he's heaped his love on you. It's, it's poured out. I mean, you're, you're soaking wet with the grace of Christ. God is compassionate. He will test you. He loves to multiply through brokenness, so don't be scared of being broken. And he wants to bless you beyond your need. Trust in him. My prayer is that we would stop counting beans and only seeing what is around us, but instead look up and see the one who created everything and who can do anything through us. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, you're incredible. Here we are on a Sunday morning, and we've taken time out of our day to come into this place. Think about what we just heard. <laughs> Up to 10,000 people got fed with seven pieces of food. Forgive us, Lord, when we lack faith in you. Help us to trust in you more and more. And to realize you're the kind of God who wants to feed that many people, who loves us that much, with leftovers, so that the, uh, the disciples could continue on their journey with food. Praise your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you all stand for this one?
couldn't do it. No. Thank you, Jerry. Um, I'm going to ask Melissa to come up. Uh, most of you, I think, are aware, or some may not be, but this is October, but it's also Pastor Appreciation Month. And we're very fortunate here, very fortunate to have... Come up here, Mr. Blondie. <clears throat> we're very fortunate to have two of the very finest people that I know of to be, pa to be our pastor, but also someone who's behind him to give him the support and give all of us the support, especially in this terrible time that we've experienced in the past two years. So on behalf of the church family here this morning and those who are watching, I want to present Pastor Rob with a gift of our appreciation and for Melissa. Thank you very much. I didn't know that was happening. <laughs> thank, you. thank you, Peter. Uh, I guess I could, on behalf of Melissa and I, where'd she go? Oh, she's gone. That's okay. Um, really want to say thank you for all your support during the last little bit. And uh, over the years that we've been here, God has been good. I'm so glad that he called us to come here. And, um, and if you're new to Windsor Baptist, I'm glad you're here too. Um, I, just really encouraged by all that God has done and um, the changes that have taken place. So praise God for all that he's done on our behalf. Amen. I want to, um, oh, you can clap. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, back to business. Enough play, enough play. <laughs> um, as we close off, just... Uh, Again, Bible studies going. The uh, support group tonight is, is uh, postponed for next week. Uh, and I did catch wind, too, that the Tuesday morning group that uh, Pat Miller is looking at, maybe getting that going again, so that'll be great. Uh, <laughs> I did start a podcast, so we are getting, we continue to advance our, our social media ministries, and uh, hopefully you've been able to um, hear the first episode, calling it The Vine a podcast of Windsor Baptist, Nova Scotia. Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. So just helping people connect, connect with him. And uh, hopefully we can expand that as we continue on. Let's close off in prayer, shall we? Uh, Lord, I thank you so much for your good gifts. <laughs> I just preached on that. I wasn't expecting anything today. I pray that each one here would be blessed the same way that Melissa and I have been. Lord, I pray that as people call out to you, and I know that some of us might be feeling pretty low this morning, I pray that you would shower them with your love and your peace, and that we would leave here knowing that we've met with you, that we aren't alone in our faith. There's a world out there that wants to crush it, wants to isolate, divide us, and bring us down. But when we come here together with the worship team that we have, we exalt your name, and we know that we are not alone. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you've given to us. In your name we pray. Amen. Have a great week, folks. Yes, we're leaning, we're leaning, we're